Today we're coming at Adam Scott Friedman from the Department of Hepatology for a discussion on hepatic fibrosis and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Dr. Friedman is a professor in the Departments of Liver Disease and Pharmacological Sciences at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He received his medical degree from Mount Sinai, after which he pursued his medicine residency at the Beth Israel Hospital at Harvard Medical Center. He completed his gastroenterology fellowship at UCSF before serving as a senior faculty member there for 10 years. During a 1995 sabbatical from UCSF, he was a senior Fulbright scholar and a visiting professor at the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel. Dr. Friedman has performed pioneering research into the underlying causes of scarring associated with liver disease and was among the first to isolate and characterize the hepatic cell itself. His work has spawned an entire field that is now just realizing its translational and therapeutic potential with new antibiotic therapies for liver disease reaching clinical trials. <clears throat> He has been the Division Chief of Liver Disease at Mount Sinai since 2001, and he was appointed as Dean for Therapeutic Discovery in 2012. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Friedman. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. This is an incredibly exciting time in our field, and uh, hopefully I will share some of that enthusiasm. I have some great old friends in the audience who I may give a shout out to, so thank you all for being here. Uh, these are my disclosures. I won't go through them one by one, but it, it does reflect the, <laughs> the fact that it is an incredibly vibrant time in our, in our field. Ten years ago, I would have had none on this list. So if anything, this is a reflection of the extreme excitement about drug discovery in liver disease and fibrosis. So let's uh, zero in on the problem. Scarring of tissues is a major problem, and it's not just one that affects the liver. Of course, that's what I'll be talking about for the remainder of uh, this lecture. But it's worth remembering that 45% of all deaths in industrialized nations are attributable to scarring diseases of one sort or another, and yet we don't have, well, now we have two uh, modestly effective therapies, uh, but none in liver yet for antifibrosis. And the key organs that are affected are shown here. Certainly cardiac fibrosis is now recognized as the major cause of normal ejection fraction heart failure. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, Maria Padilla is here in the audience, a world expert, and we have one of the largest cohorts in the world. Renal fibrosis, Si Jang He is a world's expert in renal. Uh, and then in our neighborhood, uh, pancreatic fibrosis, which is often overlooked, but remarkably similar in pathogenesis to liver, and of course liver fibrosis, which I'll spend the rest of my time uh, introducing. Now, in order to understand fibrosis, it's worth taking a little bit of a survey of the different cell types in liver. And of course, uh, if one were to look at this without a title, you'd focus mostly on these large cells in the liver, which are hepatocytes, or maybe the endothelial cells, uh, or maybe even the macrophages or Kupfer cells. Uh, you probably would overlook this, uh, this little inapparent cell with a little bit of vitamin A droplet indenting the nucleus. And yet this is the stellate cell. And for many years, the, mis the, the source of fibrosis in liver was controversial and often attributed to be these larger cells, hepatocytes. And in fact, when I started in the lab for the first time as a fellow in 1983 at UCSF in the lab of Monty Bissell, the dogma was that we should isolate hepatocytes, study how much, they how much collagen they make, and interrupt their production of collagen. And so I spent six months in absolute futility as a new lab uh, fellow, uh, culturing hepatocytes using methods Monty had pioneered, uh, and then uh, coaxing them into growing what amounted to almost no collagen at all. Uh, so we stepped back six months into this uh, futile escapade uh, and decided to look back at the literature. And we saw that really what was always associated with scar in injured liver was a cell type that had these vitamin A droplets, but also had features of a, of a fibroblast and was often termed a myofibroblast. So we reasoned that if we could isolate these cells based on the fact that they're rich with lipid, uh, that may establish a new method for growing these cells in culture. And for one of the few times in my career, the prediction actually held true, and we were able to isolate and culture these cells for the first time. And so here's what they look like in a schematic. Uh, this is a normal liver here, and what you can see is they are actually a normal constituent of the subendothelial space, that is, the space between endothelium and hepatocytes. Uh, they are really pericytic-like. They encircle the sinusoid, and again, their most characteristic feature are these droplets of retinal esters or vitamin A compounds that are lipids that impart a buoyancy to the cell that allowed us to isolate them and grow them in culture. And that really opened the door uh, to trying to understand how these cells are regulated and what their potential targets might be to interrupt uh, fibrosis and collagen production. And that was a, a question we laid out in about 1983, 1984. It still remains a very fertile area and one that's the major focus of our work uh, here at Mount Sinai. 
Now, one other concept that's really important is that when an organ scars, at least in terms of liver, uh, the cells that are recruited are more similar than different across different etiologies. And so the, the three big diseases that we take care of here at Mount Sinai and throughout the United States are viral hepatitis B and C, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, alcoholic liver disease, which is terribly overlooked and a major cause of morbidity and mortality, and we have uh, expertise now increasingly, Tom Schiano, Gene M, and our faculty, who are really uh, experts in this uh, un um, underexplored disease of alcoholic liver disease. And in fact, I'm going to talk mostly about non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. There are, in fact, other diseases that converge on this fibrogenic signaling, and they're listed here. I won't go through them in, in great uh, detail, but most recently there's been advances in cholestatic disorders uh, and immune disorders, as well as drug-induced liver disease. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to focus on this entity known as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and I'll tell you why based on the epidemiology in just a second. So one of the remarkable things about liver that we've known empirically but never still been able to explain is that the liver has an extraordinary regenerative potential. Uh, we know that surgically because our surgeons can use a healthy living donor transplantation. They can resect two-thirds of a healthy liver with the vessels and the bile ducts, use it to transplant into a, healthy, into a sick recipient, and both the donor liver and the recipient liver will grow back to full size. So, the liver has this still mysterious capacity to regenerate more than any other organ. And that really informs the natural history of the disease when patients have chronic <coughs> liver disease. So typically patients have, whether it's viral hepatitis, alcohol, or NASH, they have a slowly smoldering illness that will play out over decades rather than years. Um, and ultimately culminates in cirrhosis. Now this transition from normal to end-stage fibrosis, which occurs in decades in liver, occurs in years to months in lung and years, five to ten years in kidney. So there's clearly a spectrum which at one end, the most severe is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and at the other end is cirrhosis, where cirrhosis takes decades to develop, and we believe that's in part because the liver is constantly fighting off the injury and regenerating until after decades, ultimately, liver failure ensues. And one of the other major complications of uh, cirrhosis that we've begun to appreciate, particularly here at Mount Sinai, is hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, this represents the second leading cause of cancer mortality in the world, the fastest rising cancer incidence of any tumor. And I'm proud to say that uh, we actually, uh, Joseph Lovett, Myron Schwartz, and I uh, lead a liver cancer program here that has NCI designation as part of our NCI Cancer Center. It's the first such liver cancer program in the United States. Uh, so this is a huge unmet need, and it's related to fibrosis, as you can see. Now, certainly at Mount Sinai, for decades now, we've been a world leader in liver transplantation, and that is, in fact, an effective therapy both for end-stage liver disease and in selective cases for hepatocellular carcinoma. But we're now confronting a new disease, which I'll show you again in a little more detail, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. A recent study by Zobir Yanasi at uh, Fairfax Innova in Virginia estimates that at least 64 million Americans, 64 million Americans, that's minimum, cons conservatively one out of five Americans has fat in their liver. A subset of those patients will have a more inflammatory component called steatohepatitis. Uh, but this represents a disease that conservatively is 10 times more prevalent than hepatitis C. And again, hep hepatocellular carcinoma, which I'll get into in a little more detail, is a major complication of NASH, perhaps more and earlier than in other causes of liver disease. So this is the spectrum of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. When one says NAFLD, uh, one is referring to the, the entire spectrum, which can include a non-inflammatory stage of steatosis. But we get worried, and we think about clinical trials, when the disease starts to include inflammation, ballooning, or damage to hepatocytes, as well as uh, um, early fibrosis, and ultimately, again, correlates, it uh, culminates in cirrhosis and may be complicated by hepatocellular carcinoma. So what are the prognostic implications? So if a liver simply has fat, which again, conservatively, is 30% of the population, then the progression rate to cirrhosis appears to be very low, although we have very inadequate natural history data. We're beginning to learn that just because a patient has bland fat in 2017, that doesn't guarantee that in 2019 or 20 they won't have inflammation uh, and injury that predisposes to cirrhosis. But generally speaking, biopsies that include only fat and no inflammation and fibrosis have a low progression risk to cirrhosis. Uh, 
But when any extent of inflammation and fibrosis is present, the progression to cirrhosis is uh, quite high and, and really worrisome. So clearly, as and the FDA has been very clear about this, they want us to be thinking about treating these patients, not the patients who simply have fat. Uh, and that's reasonably, uh, that's certainly a solid recommendation, in part because there's a lot of spontaneous improvement and worsening that comes along with these early stages that actually has confounded some clinical trials because patients in early stages tend to get a little bit better uh, even if they're in a placebo group. So this is just a, one of the dozens of slides one can find uh, from federal agencies and, and private foundations that underscore the remarkable prevalence of obesity, which of course is the underlying substrate from which fatty liver disease emerges. Um, and so this is looking at the prevalence of obesity or the percent of obese adults across the United States. This is actually when you pull this up online as an interactive map and it will highlight the one line, but it's clear that obesity rates are going up catastrophically. Uh, New York, somewhere in the middle, only 25 to 20, only 25 to almost 30 percent of our population is obese. Uh, the healthiest states, not surprisingly, California, um, Colorado, actually uh, Hawaii in here as well. The worst states, uh, Arkansas, Mississippi, West Virginia. But the entire transition of this map over the last 20 years has been astonishing. So whereas uh, most states were yellow 30 years ago by this, uh, now most states are orange and red and some are even purple and there's no end in sight. Suffice to say, however, if we were to come up with a magic treatment for obesity that was effective, durable, and well tolerated, uh, that would probably have a significant impact, uh, beneficial impact on the incidence of MASH. Uh, a more objective measure of what, how this disease is impacting on our practices here in the United States and particularly at places like Mount Sinai is the changing prevalence of or the changing fraction of patients who undergo liver transplantation for NASH. So what you're looking at here over a nine year period, and this is of course before the, uh, this is now eight years ago, so there was a, a dwindling uh, fraction of patients who were getting transplanted for hep C. And this is even before, well before we had uh, the highly effective uh, oral um, uh, direct acting antivirals. Now the, the rates are going down precipitously for transplant for hep C, alcohol more or less stable, hep B, and clearly NASH year on year, even up until 2009, was going up steadily and, and worrisomely. Um, interestingly, cryptogenic cirrhosis, so shown as CC here, um, is actually going down. And we think the reason for that is because as we recognize the prevalence of NASH, we're beginning to assign more and more patients with unexplained cirrhosis as having had NASH earlier in their lives before they uh, sought or were uh, uh, seeking medical attention. Interestingly, other diseases, the other disease that's going down somewhat is primary biliary cirrhosis, primarily as a result, we think, of the introduction of ursodeoxycholic uh, acid. Okay, so this is clearly a rising indication of a transplant. It's estimated that by 2020, that's three years from now, this will be the single largest indication for transplant, competing not with hep C, but with hepatocellular carcinoma. But in the end, what drives the need to transplant? It's not the inflammation alone, it's not the cell death, it's actually the scarring that results from those, those uh, injuries. And that's shown very um, acutely here in this other study by Zoberi Yanassi. There have now been two other studies uh, that come to exactly the same conclusion using different uh, sort of validation cohorts. And what you're looking at here are survival probabilities based on the um, prevalence or the stage of fibrosis at the onset of an observation period of 350 months. And it's pretty clear that when patients have a NASH fibrosis stage of four at the onset, they have a dramatically worse survival outcome. And it's the, ultimately, fibrosis has emerged as the clearest readout of uh, injury and inflammation and ultimately the, the, the most potent predictor of outcomes. And so it's no surprise that we certainly make a living worrying about fibrosis, but more importantly, the FDA recognizes that any drug that's effective in NASH over the long run must improve fibrosis or attenuate its progression because it's ultimately the advancement of fibro the advancing fibrosis that leads to cirrhosis and to a heightened risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And so, thankfully for us who've been doing this anyway for many decades, uh, we now frame all of our thinking around what is it that's driving fibrosis and how can we attenuate that, and most importantly, if we attenuate fibrosis, does that translate into improved clinical outcomes? Because that's really what the FDA insists that we show in the long run, is do patients live longer, live better, have less morbidity and mortality? Now, let me return to this concept of hepatocellular carcinoma because it's an important one. 
Uh, this is a study from Helen Reeves, who was a postdoc in my lab several years ago, has returned for many years now to her native uh, Newcastle, uh, and oversaw this study that looked at the rising contribution of NAFLD to hepatocellular carcinoma in their referral area, which is northeast England. And what you can see is there was a steady increase in the number of patients they were seeing, but perhaps more importantly, there was a rising fraction of the overall cohort that had NAFLD, shown in orange. Uh, and in fact, other studies now from the U.S., uh, and particularly the VA health system, now underscore the fact that this is uh, not only a, uh, an increasingly prevalent disease, but HCC is increasingly common, perhaps even more than it is in hepatitis C and B. And maybe part of the reason is because obesity per se confers a heightened risk of all cancers. And among those many cancers, liver has perhaps the most heightened risk. So um, in this particular cohort, fatty liver disease accounted for up to th almost 35% of the overall cancers. But here's a really worrisome statistic that's also been borne out with other studies. 30% of these patients did not have cirrhosis at the time of diagnosis of HCC. Currently, screening guidelines only recommend that we look for cancers when the patient has cirrhosis. So it's obvious that that's going to need to be revisited. If we only start screening patients for cancer who have NASH when they're cirrhotic, we're going to miss 30% of the cancers, and many of them might have been curable if they were detected early. And finally, there's a really fascinating um, statistic that came out of the same cohort in a separate paper that showed that if the patients have a particular polymorphism called PNPLA3, that confers a heightened risk of fatty liver disease and is highly prevalent in, for example, Mexican-Americans who are at high risk for NAFLD. If those patients had of a PN PNPLA3 polymorphism, their odds ratio of hepatocellular cancer is almost 13 times greater. So we need to start integrating all this information and revising screening guidelines, both looking for genetic risks of cancer in the form of PNPLA3, but also trying to assess whether the patient has even intermediate to advanced fibrosis, uh, because it's more than likely that ultimately we should be screening those patients for cancer as well. A lot of bad news, but here's the good news. Hepatic fibrosis is reversible. Now, when I was a fellow, um, and probably many of you over the age of 40, um, were uh, training, uh, and you read the textbook, cirrhosis equaled irreversible end-stage disease. Not true. Uh, of course, in the 1980s and even 90s, since we had very few treatments for the underlying liver disease, it was no surprise that we concluded that cirrhosis was irreversible. But it's become clear now that, that <clears throat> excuse me, that's not the case. So although we haven't yet seen any approvals for antifibrotic therapies, we do know increasingly that if we treat the underlying disease, particularly with the fabulous antivirals that we have for hep B and hep C, that the liver has this, expresses this remarkable capacity to remodel and restore normal architecture. And so what does this tell us? Well, first of all, certainly we want to treat the underlying disease. We also can anticipate that in a sizable fraction of patients, their fibrosis will regress. It also tells us the liver has innate pathways to resorb scar. So if the liver knows how to resorb scar, we need to interrogate those livers and figure out what the liver is doing uh, and exploit those or amplify those pathways therapeutically to mimic endogenous antifibrotic pathways. And let me show you some of the data that indicates that even cirrhosis is uh, reversible. This is a study from Taiwan looking at the impact of an effective antiviral for hepatitis B in patients uh, followed over about a six-year period with biopsies at the onset of antiviral therapy, 48 weeks into it, and then long-term on average around six years. And what you're looking at here is the distribution of necroinflammatory scores at the onset week 48 and long-term. So what you can see is before treatment, there's a sizable fraction of patients who have high scores for what's called the Nodal Necroinflammatory Score. Dramatic improvement even within a year, or a little less than a year, with most of the patients, half the patients now having minimal and the rest having only moderate necroinflammation. And by long term, six years, virtually every patient has had suppression of necroinflammation. Let's look at the fibrosis in those same biopsies. So what you can see here is that at week 48, there is in fact a modest improvement, but it's really modest. And it's only at six years uh, that there's a remarkable improvement in fibrosis stages. What does this tell us? It tells us that if we do everything right to, in, to attenuate the injury, that will get better first. The fibrosis improvement will follow. What about a more relevant disease for the talk today, uh, bariatric surgery and, or NASH? So this is a study from Philippe Maturin, who's an outstanding clinical researcher. I think he gave medical grand rounds here actually a couple of years ago at our invitation. And the same kind of analysis, in this case, looking at patients with NASH and obesity who underwent bariatric surgery and saying what happens to their biopsies uh, at the beginning and then one year after surgery. 
So first, in terms of the NAFLD activity score, which is a staging system used for fatty liver disease, dramatic reduction in the number of patients with advanced necroinflammation. What about fibrosis? An, an enlarged fraction of patients with lower stage, a reduced fraction of patients with um, higher stage from 32 down to 24 percent, clearly not as dramatic as the necroinflammation. Um, and so this begins to give us a sense of how quickly we could anticipate benefit of an antifibrotic therapy um, uh, based on this being one of the more effective therapies for, for obesity. Now, one of the unique features about NASH is it's actually a systemic disease. It's not just uh, uh, like an hepatotrophic virus like Hep B or Hep C. And so we need to also think about uh, inputs from the adipose, which are listed here, inputs from the gut, which may be uh, profibrotic, as well as from the muscle, all of which converge on the liver. And so one of the arguments in trying to treat NASH isn't just to improve the liver, it's to reset the metabolic state and improve metabolic homeostasis of the entire patient uh, in hopes that that will reduce the drivers that ultimately converge on NASH. Uh, there also are, uh, importantly, beneficial uh, activities that are antifibrotic, and I'll return to one of these in a particular, uh, a, a therapeutic uh, that uh, stimulates a signaling pathway known as FXR and TGR5, known as a beta cholic acid. Okay, so let me return and let's drill down a little bit. That's the clinical background. Let me, let me give you a little bit more uh, color around the, the biology, where we're going scientifically, uh, what kind of new tools we're using, and ultimately how is that translating into new therapies. So this is um, the, the, the fundamental pathway we've, we've been studying for over 30 years, which is this so-called activation of hepatic stellate cells. And so what happens when the liver is injured is these cells undergo a replicative burst. They make a lot more collagen. That collagen is uh, stuffing the subendothelial space between hepatocytes and endothelial cells. And this is a, a feature that was described by Hans Popper, the founding dean of this school, and Fenton Schaffner, that's known as capillarization of the sinusoid, because now there is uh, a, a uh, complete endothelium, where in healthy liver, this endothelium has fenestrae or pores. Uh, and ultimately, the accumulation of the scar is actually not a healthy thing for surrounding cells. So hepatocytes uh, lose their microvilli that you see here, and this is what we see in the patient as a rising bilirubin, a, a rising INR, a decreased capacity to clear drugs, all of which reflects uh, dysfunction in the, in the neighborhood or the microenvironment of the uh, resident cells of the liver. Now, this is actually a staged event, and this is something, this is a, a, an updated version of something we described uh, over 20 years ago um, that has turned out to be a very, I would say, robust model for how stellate cells activate. There's an in initiation, an injury, which typically comes from hepatocytes. That leads to activation of stellate cells, expression of a whole host of receptors and cytokines uh, that drive this fibrogenic cascade, and then a perpetuation stage that is characterized by a number of different phenotypic changes, all of which, in my view, are conspiracy to make SCAR. You have more cells, they're more contractile, they're more fibrogenic, they alter their ability to degrade matrix, they infiltrate into the uh, injured liver, and they amplify inflammation. And so stellate cells aren't just a passive target of inflammatory cytokines, they are in fact an orchestrator of inflammation and immunotolerance in the liver. Now most recently there's been wonderful studies in animals that start to uncover the pathways that lead to regression of fibrosis. Uh, and these are summarized here. There are really two known events that can lead to regression of SCAR in the context of the stellate cell. One is work by John Iredell and Derek Mann that identified programmed cell death or apoptosis as a critical pathway by which stellate cells become uh, or are cleared because of death. And then more recently, studies by Robert Schwabe and Tatiana Kisileva uh, showed that these cells also have the capacity to become inactivated again and revert to a quiescent phenotype that's not exactly the same as a cell that was never activated, but is not making the same level of SCAR. Um, and so these kinds of pathways have all effectively created a template for identifying and ultimately uh, interrogating antifibrotic targets. One of the other ways we can approach this uh, is using more high-powered uh, technologies, uh, and one in particular that Young Min Lee, who's a faculty in our division and is actually uh, this uh, year and next a clinical scholar in Dr. Kohler's program at Rockefeller, uh, is to use single cell transcriptomics, um, and this is based on technologies that in part have been developed by Tom Tushel at Rockefeller. So one can actually obtain unbiased samples of cells, and in particular, one lesion in the liver we're very interested in is something called the ductular reaction, because 
this is a proliferation of bile ducts that occurs in patients with NASH and other diseases that we don't really understand. And so one way to effectively extract information is to isolate individual cells from this lesion, particularly from animal models, and ultimately do gene uh, expression profiling in single cells and identify the different cell, cell types that comprise that complex uh, multicellular response. There are other potential applications for things like single cell transcriptomics, which include biomarker discovery and an analysis of circulating cells. Augusto Villanueva is here, is rapidly becoming a world's expert in liquid biopsy for liver cancer. And I would argue that these same technologies that are trying to extract information from circulating cells derived from the liver can be applied to the diagnosis of, of non-cancer conditions like fibrosis. And so we think and talk about that a lot. Uh, as a way of identifying non-invasive biomarkers of scarring. Now, one of the great influences in the last five years or so here at Mount Sinai, at least to me, has been the recruitment of Eric Schatz, Old Dudley, Andrew Kosarskis, and the enormous growth of genomics because it's opened my eyes to the power of uh, big data. This is a trade publication that underscored how this is changing our understanding. Oops. I don't know how that happened. I don't know what, well, we'll skip that and we'll go to this one. So um, one of the ways that big data can be used is to subclassify diseases in ways that aren't apparent to the clinician. Uh, this is a seminal study from Joel Dudley's group that was published in Science Translational Medicine done here at Mount Sinai in which they collected every kind of information from a cohort of patients with diabetes that they could. So um, these were type 2 diabetics. They collected clinical information, they did genomics, they did tissue sampling, um, tissue analysis. They integrated this massive amount of data. And what they came up with was the fact that the type 2 diabetes, at least in our population, is not one disease. It's actually three subtypes of disease. It's shown in this clustering map here. And here's all the genes that define each of these different clusters of diabetes. And so this is really, for me, eye-opening to understand how um, big data can actually help refine our understanding of diseases of all sorts. And not surprisingly, we're very interested in this in NASH and liver because most of, one subtype of the three in this cohort actually had a propensity and indications of advanced liver disease. Another approach, which is illustrated in this slide, which is actually from a very talented student who's here in the audience, Ben Wooden, it's now been published in Gastroenterology, is to use informatics to identify new drugs or new, uh, old drugs that have a new indication. This is called drug repurposing. Uh, and this is from a review article that I encourage you to look at from Ben, uh, Eugene Hoshida, and myself, uh, looking at, and Nick Goosens, who was a visiting postdoc, and look, uh, and, and this illustrates how one can use uh, informatics to identify new uses for old drugs. So in this case, uh, one takes liver tissue, generates a gene expression signature, uh, that characterizes the disease. And then we say, are there any drugs out there that have been characterized in cultured cells and, in, and whose gene expression data we have in which that drug creates a gene signature as the exact, the exact mirror image of this? So if this is the gene expression signature of these genes going up and these going down, and this drug in a similar cell type brings down all the genes that were up and brings up all the genes that were down, then in a simplistic but ultimately effective way, this may turn out to be a drug that's worthy of testing. Uh, and the nice thing is repurposed drugs have lots of safety data, and so we don't have to go and redo what's called phase one studies for safety. We know that they're safe, and so one can just test them in a disease model and get, skip phase one and go right to clinical trials. Um, here's an example of some work that Ben did that we presented at the ASLD meeting a couple of months ago. Uh, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, but he looked at gene expression signatures both for fibrosis, stellate cell activation, and regeneration. And ultimately what he was looking for were drugs that induced a gene expression signature that would be antifibrotic and pro-regenerative. Uh, he uh, effectively uh, uh, analyzed the data through a process or a pathway known as LINCS, and we learned a lot of this from Joel uh, Dudley and his group, and came up with the fact that nifedipine, a very well-known cal calcium channel blocker, should be predicted to reduce fibrosis and improve regeneration, and we hope to be able to test this. But certainly data in the literature would support the fact that nifedipine might actually be a great drug as an antifibrotic 
and pro-regenerative. Now the challenge with these kinds of analyses is in the end you're left with a drug that has no patent life and nobody is willing to pay for the clinical trials. And this really represents, in my view, the single largest obstacle to translating these uh, drug repurposing efforts into novel therapy. Someone has to pay for it. Uh, the National Center for uh, Advancing Translational Scientists, NCATS, um, has expressed an interest in this. They understand the power of this in getting drugs to patients more quickly, whether we can ultimately get the horsepower behind it to actually test and approve these drugs for new indications, I think is something very, very much up in the air. Uh, another way we've done this is through the work shown here of David Zhang, who's an MD -PhD, who was an MD-PhD student. He's now a fourth year student here. And I'll go through this very quickly. Basically, we asked, are there, are there specific genes that are only expressed in activated stellate cells and no other tissues? And can we use that information to identify novel therapeutic targets without having to do any bench work, just doing this through public domain databases? And so these are gene clusters that are restricted to stellate cells and not expressed in any other of these cells and tissues. Uh, and ultimately, we yielded a gene signature. I'm not going to go through that in detail. We also can use this kind of an analysis to compare the gene expression patterns in animal models to human disease. And these are uh, work, these are data from Nick Goosens and Eugene Hoshida. Some of this has been published last month in Cancer Cell. Uh, looking at the different features of liver disease amongst animal models and in the red boxes, three human liver cohorts, looking at the extent of inflammation, fibrosis, and cancer. And then again, the blue indicates that these are humans. And are there, gene expre are there uh, animal models that particularly not only reflect the inflammation and fibrosis, but also have gene signatures that correspond to human disease? And so effectively, this helps us zero in on animal models that we think have the same response to injury that humans might. And so ultimately, when we want to test drugs, we're using an animal model that resembles the human disease. And this is a crying need from, the, uh, from industry, appropriately so, uh, in trying to optimize models that really reflect uh, 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 human disease. Because ultimately, if a drug looks effective in an animal model, we want to know that it's going to work in humans. So back to the clinical world, the biggest challenge we have right now in testing these novel drugs is how do we know when the drug is effective? Unfortunately, in 2017, the only surefire way that the FDA will accept is to do liver biopsy. But that's not a free ride. It's invasive. You capture a teeny bit of a whole organ. You can't do very many of them. You can do one at the beginning, one in the middle, maybe one at the end. Um, and so this remains a crying need. And a lot of effort is underway to try to identify non-invasive biomarkers, lipidomics, fiber scan, MR. I'm going to go through these briefly. Hepatic venous pressure gradient and functional tests. So lipidomics is a new technology. It's measuring different concentrations of different isoforms. This happens to be, I'm not going to go through this in detail, this happens to be from a very small Spanish company uh, that claims that it has signatures of altered lipids, predominantly arachidonic acid, prostaglandin metabolites, that define and distinguish between NASH and non-alcohol and fatty and bland fatty liver. So this is one technology we're going to be hearing more about also from UCSD and UNC. Another technology we're now very familiar with here at Mount Sinai is FibroScan. This is a device that looks like an ultrasound, but it emits a pulse. Uh, and the speed with which that pulse travels through the liver is a function of how stiff the liver is. And so here is a region of interest that is uh, measured by the transducer as part of this device. It looks like an ultrasound, but it's not. This is about 200 times greater than a liver biopsy. Core. So you're getting more information, you're less prone to sampling variability, still not, we think, completely ideal as an endpoint for clinical trials. Probably the greatest advances are in MR technologies. So this is a technology uh, called a multi-parametric magnetic resonance imaging, and it's basically a T1-weighted image with a specialized algorithm. And what these investigators in the UK have shown is that over time, the, the liver inflammation score that they can uh, extract from these studies can predict outcomes in either all patients or in compensated patients based on the liver inflammation score. And they are now undertaking a very large um, uh, multi-center European trial to validate this as a predictor of outcomes in large numbers of patients. And fortunately, they were funded by the European uh, Union before the Brexit vote. So the real world gets involved. Um, Probably the best test that we know of in advanced patients for predicting outcomes is one that happens to be a little bit invasive. 
It's called the paddock venous pressure gradient, and it's measuring a pressure difference between the inlet and the outlet of the liver. It should be very low, but if the liver is clogged up with scar and distorted, then pressure at the portal vein coming into the liver will be higher than the pressure of the hepatic vein leaving the liver. So this is a seminal study from Lupe Garcia Tsao, who's a good friend from Yale, and she showed that if patients at the onset of an eight-year period had an hepatic venous pressure gradient of less than 10 millimeters, they had only a 15% chance of decompensation compared to those patients who at the onset had an HBBG of greater than 10 millimeters. So the real, um, this is a, the FDA likes this test, but of course it's invasive. It takes radiologists here in the U.S. or specialized hepatologists in Europe. Uh, it's not something we can do easily in large numbers of patients, and so the search is on for MR-based technologies that may actually give you the same information as HVPG without having to go into an invasive test. Now, one other test that, uh, class of tests that we tended to overlook for many years in liver is function tests. So when Dr. Padilla does a trial of, uh, for patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, she doesn't biopsy the lung to see if the drug worked. She does FEV1, FVC, six-minute walk test, uh, and assesses the function of the lungs. And we have been very, I would say, I don't want to say derelict, but naive in focusing only on the tissue when in fact the liver is such a rich functional organ. Uh, and so that's being rectified with a number of concepts that are still being tested. This is one I've worked with from a company in Israel known as Excellence, in which it's a very simple test. The patient ingests a non-radioactive C13 labeled substrate. It's metabolized ultimately into a little bit of the acetaminophen, a teeny amount, plus C13 labeled CO2 that can be measured in the form of output through a nasal cannula uh, that tells us how much C13 labeled CO2 is being excreted and how quickly. So the company is still vigorously trying to validate this, uh, this technology. We're not there yet, or they're not there yet. But it does illustrate the idea that maybe we need to move away from biopsy-based readouts for liver function altogether. So I've alluded to this, but let me spell it out for you. There are a number of regulatory challenges. We're still reliant on liver biopsy, but we need to replace it or complement it by non-invasive markers. And particularly, we need surrogate markers that correlate with outcomes. And I've listed some of them here, functional tests, imaging tests, um, fat content, which may ultimately be helpful for drugs that are intended to reduce liver fat. The challenge is, even if we show that fibrosis improves, in the long run, we have to show that that improvement in fibrosis translates into improved clinical outcomes. And if we do those kinds of studies in patients who are years and years away from complications, we'll never get to the point where uh, we can show those clinical outcomes easily in a trial. One of the ways we're trying to accelerate progress is by uh, effectively bringing all stakeholders, particularly uh, companies, FDA, EMEA, academic investigators, and others, to the table twice a year in something we call the Liver Forum that we've organized, particularly Arun Sanyal, Veronica Miller, um, to try to just simply hash out what are the standards that every trial should adhere to. Can we share information, particularly around placebo groups? How do we get these drugs into patients more quickly by effectively consolidating our knowledge and standardizing our approaches? So this is uh, some of those approaches, and I'm going to go through these quickly since none of them are approved, but I want to give you a sense of the excitement and the breadth of activities. Um, and this is from a review that Youngman Lee, Michael Wallace, and I wrote and got a couple of years ago. Uh, one approach is simply the best, which is if you can cure the underlying disease, that's uh, probably the best antifibrotic. We can also target receptors and inflammation, and the two in, in the red box are now in phase two trials. Uh, we can inhibit fibrogenesis uh, by blocking TGF-beta activation. TGF-beta is the main fibrogenic signal. And ultimately, we can try to promote resolution of, of, of fibrosis, and there are a number of approaches here. The two, again, in the red box are currently in clinical trials. And again, I'm not going to go through these in details. You can see this uh, in, the, in the reference cited. So where are we in particular in terms of NASH targets? If we look at the major lesions uh, or components of NASH, there's the fatty acid, the accumulation of fat, and here there's a number of drugs in clinical trial or in preclinical studies. Um, the first and still the most potent is the FXR agonist, but there's now drugs that inhibit acetyl-CoA carboxylase, FGF19, and others. Uh, there's also approaches to improve insulin sensitivity, and there's been some remarkable data that's come out of studies looking at GLP-1 agonists and SGL2E2 uh, antagonists, which uh, promote glucose or block glucose reabsorption and 
uh, ultimately lead to more glucose loss and perhaps better insulin uh, signaling. And Andy Stewart's here. He might be able to correct me. There's also a whole host of targets looking at the infl inflammatory cells. In particular, uh, the two most recent and most exciting are an antagonist to CCR2, CCR5, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is a chemokine antagonist, and data that I don't have that was presented by Gilead that blocks a, comp a, a molecule known as ASK1, as well as a whole host of other inflammatory mediators. There are also efforts to try to antagonize the oxidant stress and the mitochondrial injury. These are also in clinical or preclinical development. And finally, there are a number of drugs that also should be directly antifibrotic that are listed here. Um, and I'll talk about it in a little more detail. So this is a slide that I'm proud to include because it's data that was actually generated to my delight by Effie Albanis, who's here in the audience. I didn't know she was coming, but good to see you. Um, in partnership with Mark Prusansky, who's also here, who founded the company Intercept, who I also didn't expect to see. Um, and we set out on a, a small study. Um, Mark was uh, at best a fledgling uh, entrepreneur, let's say, and he was um, anxious to see if his drug might work in an animal model. And so Effie oversaw studies with Carlos Alvarez, in which we induced cirrhosis in the liver. Uh, and then we asked if we introduce a beta-colic acid, or in those days what was called INT747, will that have any impact on the disease? And the results were really quite striking. And I like to say this is the slide that launched an industry, uh, because the results really were striking, both in terms of looking at the liver, but also in terms of uh, the scar in the liver. And we also showed that this lowered portal pressure. And then more recently, a, a, a company in um, uh, sorry, a, a group in Belgium has done a much better job than we did in this and a subsequent article to reinforce the data that we presented initially in 2005 that showed that this uh, drug, which is an agonist for a very specialized kind of nuclear receptor known as FXR, that this FXR agonist both reduced portal pressure in animal models and also is antifibrotic. Fast forward a number of years, and now you're looking at the results of that drug tested in a clinical trial. This is known as the Flint trial. I wasn't involved in this study, but I was certainly delighted to see the results. This was published in The Lancet, and it was conducted by this, uh, jointly with the company and the support of the NIDDK. And it was an 18-month trial comparing the drug to placebo in patients with biopsy-proven NASH. And what was most heartening is that data we had generated in 2005 now, almost 10 years later, shows up as predictive of a therapeutic benefit after 18 months of therapy with an almost doubling of the number of patients who had an improvement in fibrosis. There's mountains more data. Uh, as I said, most of this is published, but certainly this kind of encouraging data justified the, uh, the launching of a phase three trial, which is currently underway in many centers around the world, including here at Mount Sinai. Another approach that I've been involved with is to block uh, a particular kind of uh, inflammatory signal called chemokines, and in particular, chemokine receptors CCR2 and CCR5. Uh, this is with a company called Tobira that has now been uh, acquired by Allergan in the midst of the trial, and they read out their one year of two years data. So this is a very interesting study because they randomized half the patients to placebo, and then at one year they did biopsies, and half of the placebo patients were re-randomized to therapy. So now uh, we have groups that are placebo for two years, which is one quarter, treatment for one year, which is one quarter, and treatment for two years, which is two quarters, or half of the total patients. These are the data at one year, and they were quite exciting to us and others. It showed, again, a near doubling of the fibrosis response rate, in this case at 12 months rather than 18 months, and my prediction is the longer we treat with this and other drugs, likely the more antifibrotic benefit we will see. Uh, and so this was a significant improvement. Now, interestingly, I need to emphasize this did not meet the primary endpoint, which was to improve NASH. So this is an example where we may be targeting the downstream consequences of that inflammation in the form of fibrosis and have no impact in any obvious way on the inflammation and the ballooning and the damage to the hepatocytes uh, that ultimately drives fibrosis. But this also begs the question of whether we can think about combination therapies. And in the interest of time, I'll go through this quickly because since this is a disease that has multiple pathways, multiple targets, multiple stages of progression, maybe we need to be thinking early on about including more than one drug in a clinical trial at the same time. And that's where we're going very, very quickly uh, across the, the whole drug space. The use of or the value of a single agent is the biology is more uh, straightforward, but drug combinations can target or hedge bets. We can cover three or four different receptors or targets at the same time. On the other hand, 
single drugs have an easier regulatory path. If we try to combine drugs, one of those drugs has to be well known because if we, we cannot combine two new molecular entities in a single trial without showing that each one has some efficacy alone, although the FDA is showing increasing flexibility there. Um, I guess the other appeal is to try to uh, identify drugs that have multiple modes of action um, even though it's a single drug. And two of the many drugs that might fit that description include the FXR agonist, but also PPARs, which are uh, uh, peroxisome proliferator activated receptors, of which there's at least three subtypes that are therapeutic targets. And we can actually use informatics to try to predict which drugs will hit which targets and what additional drugs might be introduced as a second combination therapy to hit those targets in the liver that are overlooked by the first drug. Um, and so we at Mount Sinai are among centers that are really, uh, I would say, uh, seizing the challenge um, and expanding our efforts around NASH and NASH therapies. Susanna Seho uh, is here in the audience. Um, she's a physician uh, who functions here as one of our senior coordinators uh, and is overseeing most of these NASH trials. I'm not going to go through them in detail. I just want to leave you with the idea that if you're seeing patients with fatty with suspected fatty liver disease, you should engage us early and often, uh, in part because we need to help uh, detect the state of disease and in part because there may be clinical trials available. And Andy Stewart has been a fantastic partner in trying to develop a program where we collaborate with diabetes and perhaps have a hepatologist in the diabetes practice intermittently to identify patients to enhance the quality of care and ultimately to enroll in more clinical trials. So I hope I left you with the impression that there's a lot going on. Uh, this is, you know, for a physician scientist who, who's uh, plugging away in the lab in the 1980s, who dreams that someday we might have antifibrotics, this is about as good as it's going to get. So I'm enjoying the ride. I'm learning more than I ever did. Uh, and this is really just the beginning. A colleague of mine um, has actually an analogized this to the, the development of hep C therapies. Uh, if you remember, hep, th hep C started with monotherapy with interferon, which had a 5% response rate. Then, pegylate, then interferon was added, and it was about a 40. Then pegylate interferon, 60. And it took about a 15-year period to go from monotherapy with interferon that was poorly tolerated and not effective to combination therapy, now direct-acting antivirals that cure 95% of patients. We are in the monotherapy with interferon equivalent in NASH now. This is just the beginning. Um, so I encourage you to stick around, invite me back in a couple of years, and hopefully I'll have a little more to say. <laughs> so let me just summarize, and we have plenty of time for questions. I would say the arc of success in hepatic fibrosis has reached the patient, which again is, a, is thrilling. We know now the cellular sources of fibrosis and many of the key mediators. I'd also say that the framework of stellate cell activation that we laid out almost 30 years ago is still a robust template for understanding and defining therapies. But not all targets are embedded within the stellate cell. In particular, I didn't have time to talk about it, but there's a lot of reason to think that we want to amplify macrophages to degrade SCAR. On the other hand, evidence is mounting that fibrosis regression may be possible in NASH, even with drugs that have direct antiviral, I'm sorry, antifibrotic, anti-inflammatory activities and don't attack the upstream injury pathways. We still have major challenges. We need to clarify the roles of inflammatory cells, and we need to develop non-invasive biomarkers so we know within weeks whether a drug is beginning to work. Currently, we have to wait six months to a year to do another biopsy. It's not good enough. We have to do better. Uh, and then finally, we need to be cognizant of the fact that to establish long-term efficacies of drugs' effects on fibrosis have to translate into improved outcomes. The FDA has a very simple mantra. Uh, they are in the business of approving drugs that improve how uh, approving drugs that improve how a patient feels, functions, or survives. Uh, and improving a liver biopsy may not directly impact on how a patient feels, functions, or survives unless we know that improvement ultimately translates into improved quality of life and better health. So lots to discover, and uh, thank you for uh, coming along for the ride. I'll be delighted to take questions. Thanks very much. Uh, it was terrific. Uh, a few of us knew Hans Popper. <laughs> so did I, by the way. <laughs> he, he would be very proud Thank of you. you. Thank you. Uh, you know I, 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 let me interject. It's not coincidental because I fell in love with liver disease because of lectures by Hans Popper and Fenton Schaffner in Annenberg 1301 in my second year of medical school. So um, there, this is not, not coincidental. And in fact, when we do our second year course, I remind our faculty, you're going to imprint somebody today, do a good job. So thank you. Well, 
part two of my brief question sure. has to do, as you might predict, with age. Right. This illness of the liver certainly worsens with age. I mean, there's much more of it that it's worse. Would you comment on one, what that tells you, and two, why we're not paying a lot of attention to age as a factor in this liver disease? So the question is, uh, this gets worse with age, although I'm going to take a little issue with that and make a point. And why does it get worse with age? And why is this overlooked? So first of all, patients don't have symptoms when they have NASH. They have symptoms of heart disease, maybe vascular disease, maybe um, uh, obesity and its complications, and certainly the complications of diabetes. The last thing they're worrying about is their liver. So, and we don't have a perfect screening test to just simply go and, and, and look at diabetics and say that one has NASH. Certainly if they have an elevated AL2, we get worried, but normal ALT won't protect us either. So I would say in general, there's an inadequate level of awareness, and it becomes even more so in patients as they age, as the other comorbidities become very uh, a sort of attention uh, grabbing. So if a patient has coronary artery disease, who's going to worry about their liver, right? Uh, so I think that's really part of it. Now, th there, I do want to take issue with one thing, which is to say this is a disease of the age. There is a stunning and terrifying increase in NASH among young people. And I just yesterday, it turns out one of the pediatric hepatologists uh, who lives in my building is an old friend, Joel Levine, and he started telling me yesterday about eight-year-olds that are presenting with cirrhosis. So one of the challenges actually is not just to not overlook the old, but not overlook the young. I mean, if an eight-year-old has cirrhosis, it's pretty clear they're going to have a, a terribly shortened lifespan and a lot of suffering. So. Um, one of the challenges for companies is they need to come up, and the FDA is requiring this, they need to come up with a pediatric treatment plan uh, at the same time as they seek approval for adult usage. And why is this occurring in children? We don't know. But if, particularly if you go to San Antonio or San Diego or any of these communities where uh, their diet is poor but also they have high genetic risk in part because of this PNPLA3, you will see terrifying prevalence of liver disease in very young people, and it needs to be addressed. Thanks for your question. So I want to uh, speculate a little bit. Is it possible that there are lipid-soluble toxins that get concentrated to then make the fibrosis? Is it possible that lipid-soluble carcinogens get concentrated to make the uh, cancers? Dr. Greenberg, you always come up with the best questions. <laughs> and this is no exception. So I'm going, to read, I'm going to distill your question about lipid-soluble toxins leading to injury into a very important component that I basically didn't mention, which is the microbiome. So if you want my, my biased opinion, our genes haven't changed in thousands of years or modestly. How does a disease show up in a 15-year period? Um, our genes don't change. Our diet, maybe. Our exercise, maybe. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, uh, you know, to me, it, the most compelling explanation is that our microbiomes are evolving very, very quickly. And among those microbiome products are bacterial products that ultimately may be carcinogenic. So there have been animal studies that actually show that particularly that uh, bile acid um, metabolism by, by bacteria in the gut of experimental models may yield intermediates that are more pro-carcinogenic through reabsorption in the portal vein and portoenteric circulation. Um, so I think uh, I'm glad your question. I'm glad you, you asked the question in part because it gave me a chance to um, introduce this vital concept of the microbiome. And there's incredible animal data. You can take skinny mice, uh, transplant an obese mouse microbiome, and they become obese and develop liver disease. And there's even anecdotal studies in humans uh, where uh, patients have undergone fecal microbiome transplant um, for C. Diffi C. difficile and have acquired an obesity phenotype uh, because the donor of that microbiome was obese. So um, this is something, you know, we couldn't interrogate this whole pathway until we had the kinds of high-power big data approaches that I described in a different context. Now that we can begin to sequence bacteria and characterize them, and that's being done here too, we have great microbiome investigators, we need to understand better why and how the microbiome is changing. And if you ask why now, if you speak to Marty Blazer at NYU, he'll tell you because of the the uh, widespread use of antibiotics, both in our foodstuffs through animal uh, grain, but also in terms of our indiscriminate use of antibiotics for many illnesses. All of that has led to a, a, a fundamental change in our microbiome that is driving a lot of this epidemic.
Great. Let's thank Dr. Friedman for his time. Thank you.